Hi everyone, and welcome to a Gem of a Secret podcast. My name is Donatella My Secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. Coco, how are you doing tonight? Um, I've realized that accessibility is really challenging when it comes to captioning a video because it makes you take an entire evening for five videos. Oh my gosh, yeah, I did one and I had to caption frame by frame for my digital drive performance. And uh, yeah, let me tell you, these digital performances, there's a lot of work that goes into them, so support them. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and I have to I have to honestly say though, this has taken more time than a regular drag show. Yeah, but are you happy that you've learned some type of skill? I am, well, I am, I am. I just like, now I'm just really excited for the show to be here. Yeah. So I can like see like my fruit, the fruits of my labor. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'm excited to do more. I'm excited. It's cool seeing other people's stuff because then you get to compare it. Um, And you could be like, oh, next time I'm going to really go cinematic and all out with mine. And you know, like it's really neat to see what other people put together with these. Yeah, seriously. So that was a fun tangent. Yeah, for <laughs> real. So we ended last episode talking about safe sex and knowing your status. And um, it only seems natural going into this part two of this Taboo Topics episode that we start again with sex. So. Yeah. Sex, sex, sex. <laughs> um, <laughs> gosh, Specifically, we... though. Yeah. We're going to talk about sex work. Yeah, we're going to talk about sex work. And what what's the phrase um, that you always see? Make sex work legal? Is that yeah, what it is? Yeah, or decriminalize oh, sex Oh, decriminalize work. sex work. That's mm-hmm. what it is. Yeah. Um, so um, I know that people are always like, wait, what? What are you talking about? Let's like back it up just a little bit. So when it comes to sex work, because um, they say decriminalize sex work, because nowadays you have to imagine like it's very unsafe for somebody to be in sex work if they don't have access to services because they're afraid of getting arrested. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, it's extremely unsafe. So decriminalization allows for it to be a safer environment. And um, you know what? Sex work is also the oldest profession in the book. It really is. So why not decriminalize it? I think it's, it's a victimless crime, just like drugs are. A right. Lot of the time. Well, and then honestly, if they decriminalize sex work, do you imagine how much safer it would actually be? Yeah. Like, I mean, not I even the sense of like STIs or whatever, but of course that. But it would literally be like when you think about it, like a whorehouse or something like that, but mm-hmm. it would be like a nice upscale hotel. Yeah. And th- there'd be screenings and like there would be like there'd be money. Like, like it just. It feels like it would be so much better because when you, like, everybody's heard the story that sex work back in the day, I think it was part of one of those Adam Ruins Everything videos. Oh, yeah. That sex workers, like, women had a lot of power because they had money. Mm -hmm. Um, And, like, people would listen to them and stuff like that because they were in prostitution. And that's just... Yeah. The other reason that we're also talking about this is because drag artists specifically just like we said with drugs and alcohol, I have strong ties to sex work. Definitely. I think drag in its infancy started out sort of as something that was seemed to be fetishized. And today still is. I mean, yeah. you still you still do see people who are um, so-called chasers mm-hmm. that go around and um, specifically want to date people that are either drag queens or um, femme presenting um, mm-hmm. or uh, trans females. A lot of the time people will go out and seek trans females specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, so you do still see in some ways um, people that are part of the LGBT community that identify in these different sects, sex, <laughs> um, <laughs> as um, being sort of fetishized. So um, it started out that way. And we definitely nowadays, I still think think that there is a bit of prevalence um, mm-hmm. of sex work with drag. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think, you know, get your money where and while you can. But mm-hmm. being safe and ha- being in a safe situation um, is most important. And decriminalization could accomplish that. Yeah, well, and then, like, even in the escorting business, like, which obviously is another term that drag artists use for this, mm-hmm. it's, they oftentimes get to be a little bit more selective. So, like, let's talk about Pose, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, Pose is a TV show that kind of hit the scene real hard because it talks about that ballroom culture of, yeah. you know, of, of the time with the AIDS crisis and everything at the same time. So, the thing about that show is it kind of starts off with talking about sex work and yeah. one of the guys who actually is like becomes a main character um, is into sex work. Mm-hmm. I mean, 
And, like, he goes to live with the of somebody who's in the barroom scene slash in the drag mm-hmm. scene. And, you know, and that was so common. Like, back in the day, you would have mothers of houses who mm-hmm. are drag artists or ballroom scene people. And they just, and they would take in people off the streets, you know. And they had those coin slots and whatever where people would, like, you know, get naked and whatever. And so people can live out that fantasy. Like, mm-hmm. this is very very much so and great in our culture and and even on talking about sex work like even when you watch a drag performance even nowadays like the sexualization of drag is super empowering for people because mm-hmm. you have to imagine that some people who start drag um i always liked my favorite quote is just like nobody does drag because we're okay um people do drag as an outlet to actually make themselves feel better and like so for even for instance for me like out of drag i wear very loose clothing and you know i'm very male presenting but in drag i like something tight i like something sexy and i want to feel that strongness and that power and like being able to be in control of my sex and my body and my personhood is such a huge thing and it's all tied to that historical root of sex work that we came from definitely because it's it's almost celebrated yeah 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 it is um and i think it's something that we're going to still see continue to be part of drag culture um and not something that really goes away i think it's something that will be around because it started along with the craft in its infancy yeah well and what bothers me about this is obviously rupaul never said in like one of those specials or whatever that Mm -hmm. you know that she was ever into sex work or whatever like that but what bothers me about drag race is they don't talk about sex work enough Mm -hmm. they really don't it doesn't come out of the show and i know sex sells but they're like literally sex doesn't sell it's like their dirty little secret that they kind of sweep under the rug it is and i bet you they have talked about it but the editors were like "Mm, no yeah yeah we're gonna move on to our next topic and this is uh, a topic that i actually saw from a YouTuber that was also kind of talking about taboo topics within the gay community specifically. Um, Our podcast is relating specifically to the drag community because that's the perspective that we offer. And uh, it's relational aggression. So this YouTuber's name was Jacob Michael. And relational aggression is something that we see very common uh, in adolescents, in women. And it's basically a type of aggression that uh, instead of physically physical aggression you know you have all sorts of different types of aggression relational aggression is about uh hurting or destroying or harming someone's social ties so it could be hurting someone's reputation it could be basically um making fun of someone in front of a group of people to make them feel ashamed for some reason that sort of thing and it's something that i feel like i've noticed specifically in um how a lot of queens like go at each other is through a relational aggression a lot of people want to try and badmouth a lot of times someone's reputation as a way for them to not get as many gigs i know it's something that's happened to both of us yeah and it definitely has and it people like to go to public platforms to try and hurt people's reputations So what's interesting about this is like, as Donna was explaining it to me before we started the episode, the root of it is like literally not wanting somebody to succeed yeah, and trying to dismantle, like trying to tear apart their world a little bit. Yeah. Like, and making them think things about themselves. Cause like, I keep thinking about when Donna said about the whole, in a crowd, somebody might make fun of somebody to get the laughs or whatever. Mm Mm-hmm. And it does feel, I'm going to talk about it in a devil's advocate sort of way, because I think this will make it better for the conversation, because people are probably already feeling incredibly defensive. (laughs) I do remember, when I make a joke at someone's expense in a group of queer people, Mm -hmm. and most people laugh, including the person I'm making fun of, it makes me feel incredibly good. Yeah, I mean, oh yeah, that's great. But I feel like there's also a place of maliciousness that some of those instances could come out of. It's not all just fun and games. No, and I, I, I agree. I'm playing devil's advocate here because I like I think I have a lot of these identifiers, I suppose, mm-hmm. as a defense mechanism to be accepted and make friends. Yeah. Because um, even in our current friendship group, I noticed that we tease each other a lot, and that's yeah. fine. All friends tease each other yeah. across the board. But I have noticed that even in the queer communities, like... My favorite saying, and I think this relates, is um, 
I think it's like uh, being bitchy isn't a personality or yeah. something like that. Being um, young, young, gay, gay and sassy is... or something like that. Yeah, isn't a personality type. Yeah, yeah, because it does. It it hits you so sideways. And I I actually found my fi- found myself gravitating away from those people. Yeah, like because what happens is you realize that there's not much there. There's not. There's not. And there's probably a lot for them. A lot of honest, honestly, trauma. I keep going back to this. I'm going through therapy, everyone. So I'm going to talk about trauma a lot on this podcast, okay? <laughs> uh, but there's probably a lot of stuff that they haven't addressed within themselves. So they're projecting. Yeah. And a lot of people don't have the emotional and mental maturity to be able to um, recognize issues themselves and yeah. better themselves because of it. I am a big supporter of therapy. I think it's yeah. really important for people to check in with themselves. Um, that's beside the point, but I just wanted to say that therapy yeah. is a plus. Get therapy, everybody. It is. It is. <laughs> I think, especially with this though, we see it mostly, I think in between Queens, the way that I've seen it done is like kind of to do with gigs, you know, you'll mm. see, you'll see some people if they want to get really malicious, they can ruin someone's reputation by going and bad mouthing a certain person. You know? Oh, I never even thought about this. Keep in mind, this is a new topic for me too. Yeah, and um, because I've been a show producer for many years now, mm-hmm. and I prided myself on giving everybody an opportunity, but. Actually, now I think I can actually relate it to the other side of the coin, because what would happen back in Grand Junction is I used to get people saying to me, well, Coco won't put me in gigs because she's mean or she's awful Mm -hmm. or she's terrible. And I remember my favorite moment in the gosh dang universe, and Donna was there for this, is that um, a girl in our town at the time who was new confronted one of the people who was saying this. Be like, you told me that Coco doesn't put you in your in her shows. Um, but she said that she allows everybody and the girl was put on the spot in front of me and Donna and this other entertainer and the girl backpedaled. She's like, well, I just, I just feel like that sometimes. It was like a character assassination for me. And it just, and, and what, and that does suck because it does put you in a, it's almost like gaslighting, but not really. Yeah. It's, it's a different type of psychological aggression. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I'm feeling from this. And cause I do feel we all want to be accepted so hard. And so we jump on board with doing what we can to succeed. And what, why do you think people have relational aggression? I think that it kind of goes along with the bitchiness that is synonymous with the gay and drag community. I feel like it is a less physically aggressive way of handling issues you have with someone and not handling them in a good way. I think it definitely Mm. escalates things. But I think that people who practice it a lot probably are just lacking mostly in maturity in some ways. And I think it kind of goes back to the discussion we had the last week talking about cancel culture. I think that's a form of relational aggression. You're trying to, Hmm. at that point, slander someone or talk bad about someone to the masses. That's a sort of relational aggression. Have you ever wondered, like, this is just as a side note, it's really on topic, though. I've always wondered... What do you hope to accomplish with putting someone in that position? Relational aggression or even cancel culture. And like, since cancel culture is what we talked about last week, let's say Mm -hmm. that. Like, so say somebody says the N word to you or something like that, or calls you some really horrible derogatory term, you blast them on the internet and everybody's coming after them. What do you feel now? Like, yeah. As the person who was the victim, you've blasted them and everybody's attacking them. Say they even lost their job. They lost their job. Yeah. Their girlfriend left them. What do you... Do you feel good at the end of that? I think most people don't. And yeah. I think, I, think it's, I think it's too late by the time it already gets out there. I think a lot of like the knee-jerk reactions we get to blast people online end up we end up regretting that situation later because it's like, oh, like if, if people really come down on hard on them, it's it's your fault. And right. especially if it's for something minor. If it's for something big, like a racist issue, like we saw with that lady in the park that was calling the cops on the guy that was bird watching or whatever. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't feel sorry for her for losing her job. She's crying and saying her whole life has fallen apart. But honestly, like, that's what you get for being a bitch. Yeah. Like, you, you could have handled that situation a lot better. She really could have. Like... And she was the one that was doing something illegal. He was just getting on to her about right. not having a dog on a leash. And honestly, for all intents and purposes, she's going to be 
fine. She's not going to get charged with anything. Yeah, she's She'll probably be... get another job. She's a white woman in America. Yeah, and, like, a lot of people don't actually Google folks who say she's going to be fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. She is. She is yeah. going to be fine. And, because the thing is, I have been wondering ever since we talked about this last week, sometimes I like to feel special when it comes to the negative outcomes of people around me. Like, if something happens with somebody, I like to, I like to recognize that I, it makes me appreciate what I have in my life. Mm-hmm. And, but I don't attack people to make the things I like in my life more concrete. I feel like there is a lot of internal introspection that needs to happen. If you are one of those people, like if we've said anything that's triggered you a little bit saying like, Oh, I don't think that I'm a bad person, but I've done some of these things that we've mentioned. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're a bad person. It just means to really check that ego and understand who you are. And then recognize that if your actions are hurting other people, um, and you feel like you might lose something like friends or yourself or your relationship because you're not going to be that bitchy gay anymore or you hate being the bitchy gay, then maybe you need new friends. Yeah. And most people will end up still liking you, even if you change a little bit to be a better person. Yeah. Definitely. Um. So I, I forgot to mention this like I always do. It seems like every single episode for some silly reason. Um, so Donna, how are you doing this evening? You know what? I will let you know right after this brief commercial break. Rose Dynasty presents Drag Storytime with Mama Ashley Rose every Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Mama reads stories to children of all ages on Facebook Live, so be sure to grab your drag babies and tune in this next Sunday at 2 p.m. for the story of the week. It's a podcast it with Coco and Donna tell a podcast. Check it out. Tune into what they tell you podcast. Check it out. With Coco and Donna, tell a podcast. Check it out. We are back. And Coco, you know what? I am feeling my femme fatale fantasy today. I got into drag and I dressed up as one of my favorite characters from one of my favorite action movies of the 1960s. And um, I just wanted to stay in that drag for the rest of my life. We'll post a picture of what Donna's talking about on our website. What's our website, Donna? Our website is a gem of a secret podcast dot com. That's a gem of a secret podcast dot com. Thanks. Have you ever felt your fantasy like that though, where you're like feeling it so much that you're like, I don't ever want to take this drag off. I want to preserve this. I actually it's funny because I was talking about this in the sense of there, because there's two pieces. So Donna dressed up as somebody she always wanted to dress up as, mm-hmm. and then she did it well. So with me, I post, I posted a picture of a side by side with my mom, who was roughly around the same age, with us both wearing afros, uh-huh. and I loved that. I mean, I wasn't in love with the drag I was doing at that time, mm-hmm. but there, I actually took a photo. I think it was a year ago today. Um, where I started doing my potato drag and I was like really slimmed and I was like feeling my fantasy and I had this high top ponytail and my makeup was fa hears. Yeah. And I was just like feeling that fantasy so much that when I went home to take it off, I was so sad. You get sad. sad. (laughs) So sad that all this creativity on my body is now in a bathtub drain. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Speaking of the body, we're going to talk a little bit about body image. Oh my goodness. So I, uh, just to let folks know, like about eight, nine years ago at this point, I actually lost about a hundred pounds. I have officially, as of yesterday, gave, gained it all back. Um, <laughs> that's fun. But yeah. the thing is, like when it comes to drag and body image, like it's actually a really big thing. We don't talk about it a lot, actually, in the drag community. It's not like it's subject or conversation that comes up very often because you'll see queens like Latrice Royale, who's very plus size, or Darian Lake, or Eureka O'Hara, or Ginger Minj, who are overweight drag queens who, you know, are succeeding in the business. But the fact of the matter is, like, drag, drag artists are kind of booked on notoriety, likability, and for lack of a b- better term, fuckability. Yeah. Um, and Especially if you're booked out of your city. Oh, yeah. Most drag artists, not most, I will say a portion of drag artists who get a booking out of city is because somebody really wants to meet them. And oftentimes what that means is something a little bit more scandalous. Yeah. It yeah. is. So body images and tribes. Explain tribes for our listeners. So there's different tribes, as we know, in the gay community. Uh, You have your bears, who are more burly uh, men with hair. Uh, We also have our otters, who are skinnier, hairy guys. Uh, You have your twinks. You have, uh, let's see, what else? You have your daddies. Your daddies. Your your leather. Your leather. Tribes and all of that. So 
It's interesting for me because I feel like as a queen, I have never specifically fit into any tribe. Like even right now, I'm kind of looking a little bit ottery when I have like no shirt on. I, I have like a lot, a lot more chest hair than I've ever had because I am wearing a breastplate more often. So, mm. and I, I kind of like it. Like I don't want to shave my chest ever again for drag. Oh yeah. Um, so I, I think I'm just going to rock the breastplate or cover it, you know, for the rest of my drag career. But um, basically I have never felt like I fit specifically into any of these tribes. I've always felt like just a queen and it's kind of in some ways made me feel a bit on the outskirts when it comes to all of these tribes yeah. among the gay community. I feel a little left out. Yeah, I felt incredibly isolated, especially in Grand Junction. I I knew very early on that like I was a bigger guy and um it's funny cuz I had that same um wherewithal to understand that like I was also attracted to twinks when I first like started liking guys Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is but it's like a like a commonality for all of us yeah um and then I started realizing I belong to this community of bigger people because you're automatically a part of it the second you recognize that you are I have a question for you Hmm. do you feel like bigger gay men who are typically bears are celebrated more than bigger drag queens uh yeah definitely so i see like even on tiktok right now um if you have a cute face and you're a chub because that's another tribe almost like it's Mm -hmm. a subsect of bear yeah like a chub like who has a cute face on tiktok you'll have tons of views um it's a confidence thing i guess to a degree but yeah like i have not seen bigger drag queens are not celebrated unless they're acting like you know, unless they're acting like Monique from way back in the day mm-hmm. or somebody a little bit more relevant today <laughs> with big, loud personality, you know. Yeah. That big girl syndrome, which is, which I don't really agree with. I, yeah. I don't think that, like, big people should have to be big and loud to be accepted by society. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like people should have to be that way either. I, so I do agree with you. I see a lot more bod- body positivity within, like, gay male tribes like you Mm -hmm. know like the bears and stuff like i don't see a lot of like skinny like twinkie gays really like body shaming anyone who's bigger a whole lot like any bigger guys like nor like i feel like like i'm definitely into a bigger guy a lot of like queens and a lot of the people that i've hung out with are as well like it's something that they see as attractive you know like a strap i like a big barrel chest you know like that's my favorite i like somebody who looks like they can fix a car and i also like somebody who looks like they like could lift a tractor above their head i mean that's also i mean and it's a plus if you could do a dance routine too oh god plus if you can do a dance routine (laughs) Jesus. but no it's because it's true like i the thing is, I'm attracted to all different types of body types and mm-hmm. all different races and sizes. Um, but I've recognized, like, I've asked this question to a bunch of people, and everybody has a type, and I don't think mm-hmm. there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. But the fact is, like, it's us queer people in general. So let's back up from the drag drag world for a second. Mm-hmm. Queer people in general have an unrealistic body type fetish within themselves they want to reach that they'll probably never will in their life definitely i can't decide if i want to be like completely built completely skinny or just like eat a bunch and like lift a bunch of weights and just be one of those barrel chested men you know right it's hard it's like it's like where do you want to fit in because it feels like there are there are so many labels and categories right and And i feel like that's probably synonymous with the lgbt Q community is labels and categories. Definitely labels and categories. <laughs> well, and because for even on my end, so on the bigger side spectrum, a lot of people who are my size, who've been my size for this long, um, tend to start looking at weight loss surgery options, um, lap band or like the gastric sleeve or whatever. And I've looked in those options too. But here's the thing for me. I like falling off the wagon. Like, I mean, even two, because I'm on a diet right now. I'm doing keto right now. And like three days ago, I fell off the diet to go to, I think we went to Taco Bell or something like that. And I got full tacos and whatever. And I really enjoyed that. And yeah, Mm -hmm. sure. It wasn't good for my diet. But like when you have weight loss surgery, your diet changes forever. Yeah. I mean, and you get sick if you, you know, fall off of your diet Mm -hmm. after you've had weight loss surgery. And I don't really want that for myself. And I, because my stomach is like. It can handle liquor, it can handle all different types of food, and, like, can go to town. And I love that about myself. So I might not be in the skinniest body, but, like, I've really considered weight loss surgery for, obviously, some health issues I'll probably develop later on in life. But at the same time, like, 
I'm good yeah. right now. I'm good. I'd rather spend hours in the gym um, and whatever, knowing that even if I fall off, like I can still, I'll still recover from it. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of these like categories are based specifically on people's preferences. They're based on the type of people that they like. So um, true. it's, it is something where if you exist outside of someone's preference and you're attracted to them, it can be very disheartening. However, I don't think that you should ever change yourself to try and fit someone's uh, preference. I think you should mm -hmm. definitely just accept who you are and the right people will come along in your life, whether it's romantically or friendship wise. Um, because I think it's also hard to make friends when it comes to distinguishing between these different tribes. I agree too. And one point that I want to throw out there for all of our listeners is you should never, ever shame someone for being unapologetically happy with who they who are. Who they are. Yeah. And it, honestly, it goes back to that relational aggression thing. Mm -hmm. But to make somebody feel bad when they're on a path that's really, like, is not hurting anybody, seems positive for them, saying, like, if they're one of those people on Facebook, they're like, I just look so cute today, and they're, like, overweight or whatever, or have some messed up teeth, or mm -hmm. however it goes, and, like, people try to bring that person down, like, why, Yeah. as a society, would we want somebody to feel unhappy in their own skin? Because I also feel like that's the lowest hanging fruit you could reach for, too, when oh, you're trying yeah. to, like, there are so many other things about a person that you cannot like, but, like, if it's a physical thing that they, like, cannot change or, so, you know, it's something physical about them, like, right. that is so low. And you're probably not really fun at parties if that's the first thing you're going to point out about someone. Like Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. Well, no, it's true. And it's so true. And even more to that point, I'm just making sure that, like, recognizing that certain things that people even can't change right away, like, saying they do have, like, messed up teeth or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's not just, like, a trip to, like, the dentist in your no, bud. No, it takes time. It does. And low-hanging fruit, stuff like that, that is, I agree with Donna, like, yeah. pick something else. And also for our listeners, because I know some people out there are not drag artists who listen to us, um, in the drag community, there's kind of this uh, hidden rule that you won't make fun of somebody else's drag, like, critically. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you don't want to ruin someone's night. yeah. You know, like they they're already done up in makeup. Like mm -hmm. you tearing them apart and being critical isn't going to help them. Right. In fact, it may make them quit. And if if you want to have more people that celebrate and enjoy this art, then you should be encouraging and be constructive afterwards. Yeah. Cuz telling somebody, "Oh, like, hey girl, I think that your makeup is cracking," mm -hmm. is not helpful. Because, no. one, they probably already notice, yeah. and they're trying hard to hide it. Because guess what? When you're at the gig, you don't usually have your full supply of makeup no, to fix mistakes. No, fuck no. Fuck no. Yeah, you just have to, like, your eyelash could fall off, and you could lose it, and nobody has any glue. Yeah. So you just take off both your eyelashes, and guess what? That's fine. Yeah. Because that's the best you could do. Yeah. So, uh, going on to our next topic, and this is something that happened to you in... Grand Junction, uh, there were people that actually used race as a form of preference when it came to, like, the type of entertainers that they liked, the type of people they wanted to date, the type of, you know, whatever. That is extremely disheartening because you are basically assigning a bunch of attributes to an entire race of people based off of your own judgmental mind, and it's wrong to do. Yeah. Um, but... Racism is something that is not completely absent from the gay com community. In fact, it is actually quite prevalent. And um, what is what is your experience with that what specifically I've, as a queen? Well, and I'm going to say this because I, I joined a bear group, not a bear group. I joined a group here even in Portland that had that had a comment thread that was talking about race as a preference and how somebody's like i just am really in to like white guys and that doesn't mean that i'm racist and i said and the thing is it doesn't mean that you're racist if you're specifically like your preference is one or the other racism comes from saying words like can't or won't mm -hmm. that's racism yeah. if you say i prefer to date white guys 
fine. If you, but honestly, even in that, even then, it's still you're still assigning negative. Tra- like why? Yeah, because like, if I would you, I would push them for their reasoning. Yeah, because when you start to unpack why somebody has a preference of only dating white people, um, it usually will end up going Rooted. back to something pretty dang racist and racism. Yeah. Like it does, and I experienced a lot. I, I I wrote about this online recently, but I'm going to explain a story to you all real quick here. So I had, I remember I was feeling my fantasy so hard at a drag queen karaoke that me and Donna were running at the time. And I sat down with one of my friends um, and I said, what, what do you think of my drag? And, or like, what do you think of this or whatever? And he said to me, and I will never forget this. And it is burned into my brain for the rest of my life. He said, well, I don't really know. And I was like, well, what do you mean you don't know? And he's like, well, I just really just don't find black women attractive. So I have no ability to tell you if you look good or not, because I'm just completely uninterested is what he said to me and it was the most earth chattering moment because one you remember like i might be by gender but i present as male in 90 percent of my life so mm-hmm. i've never gotten you're pretty for a black girl i actually have gotten you're pretty you're a pretty hot black dude which is almost on the same microaggression but it's obviously different for women mm-hmm. because it's like our like black women's worth is like devalued i yeah. guess immediately but you're trying to boost me up to that of yeah. the status of a white woman like gross, gross across the board. And um and I got lots of things like that. I used to get told real quickly, like I used to get told that I can't be attractive because I'm black in that city in uh. Grand Junction. But I've seen that across the country too. Like, um I hear the N word a lot. Um, like on Grinder especially, N word is prevalent. Yeah. Um, like if you, and it's honestly it comes after high. And so for the straight community out there, like even on Tinder or think about it sending a Facebook message to somebody and the first message back after you just said hi to a stranger is them calling you the N-word, saying they don't date that. Like, how stupid do you have to be for that to be your fucking greeting to someone? Yeah, seriously. Like, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Do you feel as a queen you have to stand out and be extraordinary um, and work harder to get that recognition. Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. I do feel like that phrase that all black people hear all the time, but, you know, recently in Scandal, the TV show, Mm -hmm. um, they used to say, you have to work twice as hard for half of what they have. Yeah. And it's such a true statement. Like, we've we've all recognized that Black people, like, they they say, like, black people are magic, but it doesn't mean we're not real. Mm -hmm. Because the fact is, like, having to work that hard to be that good, to be on point always. Like, the thing is, I have noticed that, like, when a white queen missteps or doesn't do as well or their makeup is muddy or Mm -hmm. something like that, or it will always be equated as more valuable than if I have an off day or I'm not bringing you some A-class drag every time mm-hmm. I step foot onto the dance floor. You feel like people are hypercritical. Yeah, they're hypercritical, but in a hypercritical way to where they won't book you mm-hmm. unless you are, like, literally giving it all. On top of the fact that the subtle racism is you can't be too black. Yeah. So, like, what I've noticed in Portland is if you do too black of music it won't be as celebrated. And I do mean celebrated by the number of dollars. Now, I know some people say, I tip my cup of tea. Like, if I know the song, I tip you. If you're my friend, I tip you. You know, if I feel like you're really giving it your all, I tip you. But that's literally just a facade of racism to be like, um, I'm just really not into, like, rap. Yeah, <laughs> so like, no, like, that yeah. is, that is. Like, like it's sorry, true. it's a little too urban for me. Yeah, and you honestly, know? like, and I get super kind of jealous of Donna sometimes because she always finds this really great music that, you know, is on the same line of rap because mm-hmm. it's like quick quick voices talking or like voice alterations or whatever to some poppy music Mm -hmm. and like you know quick messages that the audience can't hear unless you know the song or whatever yeah and i see her sometimes getting celebrated for those sometimes not always not all the time (laughs) but sometimes and i get really i feel a way about that Mm -hmm. i actually just merged into chart doing truly slow black music like listen by beyonce or like songs from the color purple i started doing that before covid and um it was a 50 50 review sometimes it was good and sometimes people were just like not yeah. So. Yeah. Um, there's a tragedy that's happened. Multiple tragedies, actually. This is not the only one. Yeah. Um, there have been multiple tragedies that have happened um, 
to the uh, black community as a whole when it comes to police brutality, and the most recent one being George Floyd. Yeah, George Floyd. And if you have, I mean, you've probably heard about it at this point because it is pretty viral on Facebook. But a man who was pulled out of his car by police, I think it was like for forging documents. Yeah, it was something like that. It was for forgery. Yeah, Yeah, he was pulled over. For forgery. Um, Yeah. Nonviolent crime. Nonviolent crime, pulled out of his car. Unarmed. Unarmed. Um, And then. They're always unarmed. Always unarmed. And then. Then I did see a couple of the other videos where he's, like, sitting on the sidewalk or whatever while they're, like, getting more information, and then they're going to arrest him, and then the, obviously, the viral video is where, you know, the police, like, manhandle him, and then he's on the ground, and then they're putting too much pressure on him, and he's screaming, I can't breathe, and then the reports say that he passed away, he died in the hospital. Now, um, and people are thinking, the biggest thing about this tragedy to go along with our topic in general, is that we have come to an understanding that it seems like black life continues to be measured less than other races. And it's becoming really alarming here because now, because before, obviously, like the last year was always like calling the cops on a black guy for like cooking or going swimming or existing or picking Mm -hmm. up trash in front of his own house and stuff like that. And now we're going back to murdering black folks again, like, which is obviously heartbreaking and it's really challenging and people just can't get on board with it. I mean, like people can't get on board with it like they did before. Like they Mm -hmm. were like, we're done. Like this is getting ridiculous. Yeah. And so the reason we're bringing this up obviously outside of the fact that this just happened as when this episode airs it'll be like the day before or the day before that Mm -hmm. um we do have to do better as a society and just recognize that it's all about unlearning the things that um might might be ingrained racism that we don't even recognize Mm -hmm. talk to black people learn from black people listen to people of color and recognize that the stories are different and they shouldn't be all lives really should matter, but mm-hmm. they don't they equally. Don't. They don't. And until our justice system defends people of color in the same way that they defend their so-called justice that they're serving among people, there there needs to be a change, basically, with, the, with our justice system. Yes. There needs to be. And it, it is a systemic change that needs to occur. Yeah, because if you're one of those people who feels like there should have been a higher investigation before those cops were fired, like, I have to say that you are part of the problem. Yeah, you are. You are. Because there's no reason, there's no reason that use of force should have it should have happened right then and there. There's no right. reason. And if it were any other suspect, if it were any other person that um, had a lighter complexion, mm-hmm. um, a white person, then I don't think th- this would not have been the instance. This, this wouldn't have happened if it would if it was a white person. They would not have been choked to death and af- after begging for their life. And this and the sad thing is is like these exact words are not words that we haven't heard before, um, uttered by a person as like their last words. Yeah, and it does. As a black person, I'm actually really terrified about it. Yeah. Um, because I drive, I jog in my neighborhood. Yeah. Um, I exist. Um, I've done every single thing. We went camping recently and we went camping somewhat in a zone that might have not been approved for the public. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that because we were grilling. And what if somebody called the cops on us for grilling? Yeah. What if I get pulled over? Like, what if I decide to run too quickly to my mailbox? And it takes one racist person that is involved in law enforcement to make that racist judgment against you and potentially harm you. Yeah. Yeah. And so be protective of your friends and family, especially your friends of color. But one thing I will say, which I've talked about today. Record every incident, too. If you see something happening, record it. Make sure you're getting it on video. And then also just do your part to, like, to speak out against these types of atrocities. There's numbers you can call. There's people that you could demand get fired if an incident like hap- like this happens in your local community. Do that. Exactly. And more to Donna's point, I do believe in the recording thing, but I'm tired of seeing Black Lives Lost. Yeah. As much as you should record, you should also try to intervene. Intervene. I intervene. think it's, I think we're at the point to where I know that people are afraid of intervening and going against, going against police officers, but we can't keep having us, meaning Black people, being murdered mm-hmm. because 
somebody was too afraid to intervene. Yeah. Like getting it on camera is great for the awareness, but that means someone still lost their life. Yeah, yeah. So please, please record. Please intervene. Please speak up. Say something. Yeah, definitely. All right. So, so let's bring it up to a positive note. Yes. Cause... Yeah. We're going to move on to our Feed the Positive segment. And the Feed the Positive that I would like to point out this week uh, goes to Peachy underscore Springs or Peachy Springs. She's known as the bingo queen of Portland. Um, she's really been killing it on social media lately and um, also just is such a hustler when it comes to like doing drag and, and mm-hmm. getting those gigs. Like she has so many bingo gigs that she was doing around the city before all of this uh, quarantine stuff happened. And I just really have to give her props because she is a newer queen. She's been doing this uh, for only a matter, I think a year, maybe a little more than that, maybe two years. Um, But she is just absolutely incredible and you should definitely give her a follow and support her. Yeah, definitely. Um, My feed the positive is going to be Grandma Katya or at Katya Presents. And then right now, their Instagram handle is Cool Calm Collected Katya. All with Ks. All with Ks. Also, there's no Cs. They're all Ks. So Cool Calm Collected Katya. Except for the Cs that are in Collected that aren't the start of it. So all the words start with Ks. <laughs> yeah. People are like, I won't be able to find this person. You, yeah. But visit our website at agemofasecretpodcast.com to figure out how it's actually spelled. And follow them on Katya Presents because that's where all of their gigs and uh, parties that they've done throughout Portland are going to be. Yes. And so the reason I wanted to give a shout out to Katya is because their Facebook game is solid right now. Mm-hmm. So many funny things. So cool. And this person... Um, really needed a break because they are always constantly throwing the best parties in the city. And so right now they're just sitting at home and, you know, looking into the future and seeing what that brings. And they gave me some of my first bookings when I was here. And I just absolutely adore them. And I've always had great conversations with them. Um, so I wanted to give them this shout out, especially during this downtime, because um, they're still super appreciated. And if it wasn't for them, um, I never would have got to see Evie Oddly again after I hadn't seen them since my Denver days. Yeah. So yeah. that was really cool. So yeah, my feed the positive is Kat- Grandma Katya. Woo! All right. That concludes our episode of A Gem of a Secret podcast. My name is Donatella, my secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. We'll see you next Thursday. Bye bye. This has been another episode of A Gem of a Secret Podcast. The hosts of A Gem of a Secret Podcast are Donatella My Secrets and Coco Gem Holiday. You may follow Donatella My Secrets at Donatella underscore my secrets on Instagram. You may follow Coco Gem Holiday at Coco Gem Holiday on Instagram. Original music by Touche Douche and Party Favors. You can follow them respectively at the Touche Douche and at Party Favors Music on Instagram. For more exclusive content, visit www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com. That is a j e m of a secret podcast. Dot com. Be sure to tune in every week on Thursday for a new episode wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any comments or questions, email us at a gem of a secret pod at gmail.com. Please don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. Until next time, goodbye.